For Avrakotos, dealing with the crises became routine. But at one point in 1985, he found himself having to cope with a screaming problem that seemed to belong to another century. Mules. The challenge of secretly moving tons of weapons into position for the Afghans was always a logistical nightmare. The CIA had literally hundreds of millions of rounds of ammunition constantly traveling by sea and air to Pakistan. Once in Pakistan, the lethal goods were transported by train and truck to the border. At that point, however, everything had to move the old-fashioned way, if not on a man's back, then by mule or camel. The Russians therefore placed the highest priority on hunting down and slaughtering the Mujahideen's long mule caravans. So many of these beasts were wiped out by gunships that in 1985, an urgent call suddenly came into the task force headquarters warning of a crisis that had placed everything at risk. Where the fuck do you go to buy donkeys? Avrakotos remembers asking Vickers. Later, an incredulous CIA director called Avrakotos. You've got to be kidding me. You're buying mules? <laughs> Welcome to Glorious Professionals. I'm Jason McCarthy here today with Rich. That was a reading from Charlie Wilson's War. Come to find out that Rich played what he'll call a small part in that tale and that he was one of the the soldiers on loan to to Afghanistan, Pakistan to actually take those stinger missiles to the to the Mujahideen. So wanted to kind of touch on that little small sliver of history today and and I uh, hear about a, a portion of the event that's not really cataloged in the the book at all or the movie. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna turn it back. Which was it? Episode three, I guess, is when we we had your I think so your introduction. It was me and M and and you and we went or some of the discussion was about Vietnam, mm -hmm. right? Or all right. the discussion mostly. Right. So we kind of left off there. Two tours in Vietnam, and then w where do you want to start? So full disclosure, folks out there. This is uh, something I've heard a little bit about from Rich, but I haven't heard very much or very much at all about this story. So this is all kind of news to, news to me too, similar to what it is to most of you listening for the first time. So wh where are we going to start this, Rich? Well, it probably starts at the end of my first two tours in Vietnam. Uh, I was reassigned to Okinawa to the first Special Forces Group. The fifth had been sent home from Vietnam. There was still some residual elements of the fifth operating in Vietnam, shutting down the war. And I was on Okinawa when we began prepping for some just standard special forces missions. And some people came down looking at us from another government agency. And they were looking for teams that were qualified to, to do some special missions. They, they weren't sure exactly what. They didn't share that with us, but it was there. Well, then in 74, the summer of 74, they shut down the first special forces group and brought everybody home back to, to the Fort Bragg. We were still organized as the first special forces group, but it was closing out completely at that time. But teams were still together for the most part, slowly eroding away to the other special forces groups. Because during Vietnam, there were around 12,000 special forces soldiers in the world. At the end of Vietnam, that number was cut back to about 3,000. So some of the people were being let go and others were being pushed into other special forces groups that were still existing at that time. And I still had a team that was together. And in 1975, if memory recalls, it was about April, we were tasked as a team, and we were kind of a separate team. We weren't really part of the first special forces group anymore because it really didn't exist. It was kind of a provisional unit, as, as I said, as, as pieces were taken away. Uh, we were called upon by this other government agency. They showed back up at Fort Bragg and, and said, okay, we've got a, a mission. And that mission was to go in back into Saigon and identify, pick up, and get out some VIP-type people that they had identified that they wanted to bring out. So this isn't VIP, like cut the line to get into the, to the top of the... No, no. no. <laughs> what, what do you mean by VIP? Uh, people that, that had been very supportive and or were continually identified as being supportive of government interests in Southeast Asia. 
there were probably people in there, and we didn't know. We were just told who to go get. That we were, we were shown pictures, told where the contact points would be, and the and the methods of bona fides and and contacting these people, and then getting them out of Vietnam. I'm guessing there were some intel types in there. There were some financial types in there. There were some business types in there. There's no telling if you look back at at the way America has operated in foreign countries. There's no telling who they felt was the most important people to get out. But these were important people to the, the government of the United States to get them out of Vietnam rather than have them fall under the hands of the North Vietnamese. So just to set the scene, I mean, the, the fall of Saigon is imminent. Very close. We know this is happening. There's the image of the helicopter that's too full. That's occurring as we speak. Uh, as as we were doing what we were doing, we didn't we did not use those assets. We went in a, a totally different way. But we could see the helicopters that were taking people out of the embassy, that were taking them out of Tonsonute, that were taking them out of Long Bend, all of those major bases right around Saigon. I mean, it was like an international airport. So what was just the general vibe? I, I know we got other stuff to cover, but the general vibe of the fall of Saigon, what did it feel like? It was chaotic. Uh, nobody knew what to expect. Everybody was scared. We were scared. The Vietnamese were scared that we came in contact with. The general population was scared because, it, again, it was a, a fear of the unknown. Nobody knew what was coming. Nobody knew what was going to happen. People envisioned bloodbaths, which uh, didn't really occur per se as we had seen in previous wars and previous conflicts. But still, people were arrested and taken away to internment camps to be reeducated, uh, whatever that means. So it was just a, a chaotic and a scary time for people. I, I felt terribly sorry for the people that I knew were going to stay there. The, just the average residents, the plumbers and the electricians and whoever, the, the normal guy or gal on the street. That's tough. Before we even get to why this is important, this OGA, right? There was a couple, a couple big things happened in, in the course of your career. You met some other great people who became mentors to you. Yes, uh, one of the guys that I met in, in Vietnam, he was not a close friend of mine, but I, I met him. I think he was, when I met him, he was a major, or maybe he was a lieutenant colonel, and that was Charlie Beckwith. It, he had commanded uh, an organization in the 5th Special Forces Group, a reconnaissance organization that ran in-country reconnaissance, while Mac V. Sog, that I was assigned to, was running out-of-country reconnaissance operations. And I got interested in him because he was such, he, he was a, a bigger than life type person. He was the kind of guy you think of that, uh, that can do basically anything he sets his mind to. For somebody that was already in special forces to look up to somebody like that, that's, that says a lot. And a lot of people looked up to him. He was a great leader and he was, he led from the front. So there was no question in, in your mind that he would ask you to do anything that he wouldn't do, although he had a strange way of doing that. Because basically what he told people that went to work for him was, I'll get you a body bag and a medal. And that's, for, for an av average soldier, that's not a great <laughs> recruiting tool. <laughs> but, but it was him. That was Charlie Beckwith. So Charlie Beckwith would go on to be the founder of Delta Force officially. Correct. He had worked with the SAS during that period of time. Uh, he had gone through their selection course and... The, the idea, the vision had started forming, forming in his mind of the need for uh, an extra level counter terror, counterinsurgency force that, that should exist in the United States Army. Okay. Hadn't come to fruition at that point, but it was, it was headed that way. And you got to give Forrest Foreman a plug real quick as well. Yeah, Forrest Foreman was, was probably the biggest mentor in my life. Uh, he's a retired command sergeant major, special forces. Uh, He'd been everywhere and done everything. I remember him talking about when he was a very young soldier in Lebanon when the 82nd Airborne Division was deployed to Lebanon, and he was there in Bermuda shorts and knee-high socks. And that was an official Army uniform at that point in time because it was so hot. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of how he started out his career. Uh, then he went on to, to have some great assignments. He, he served in Vietnam. He served in Thailand, just about everywhere. And he was the kind of guy that you looked up to and went to when you had a professional question about where you should go and what you should do. 
And there was a lot of questions going on at that time because everybody said, don't volunteer for anything. Well, here I was, I had, I had volunteered for the army because I didn't want to get drafted. I wanted to pick what I did. So I volunteered for the army. I volunteered for the airborne. I volunteered for special forces. And I volunteered to go to MACV SOG at that point in my career. And that's like four volunteers, which everybody says, don't do that if you're in the army or in the military, not just the army. But Forrest guided me through those early stages, recommending some schools that I attend and some assignments I should seek. And that guys like Forrest and, and Beckwith became formative to my psyche and my career later on. So I'm sure we'll have time to cover some of that at some point, somewhere down the line, maybe, or, or maybe not. But one thing that they did do was they sent you to Wales, to, to England, for 22 SAS selection. Correct. Beckwith and... and in 76, uh, I was an instructor at the, the scuba school, the Army Special Forces Scuba School in Key West. Foreman was the sergeant major of the school, and Colonel Beckwith was the commandant. And I got a call from Foreman and said, you need to get on the next airplane to, to Fort Bragg. You need to come up here for an interview. And so I did. I mean, I just, I trusted this guy so much that there was no question in my mind. So I got on hooked a ride on an airplane that was coming through Boca Chica Naval Air Station, got to, to Fort Bragg, and I reported to Foreman's office, and he said, you need to go in and see the colonel. And that's when I went in to see Colonel Beckwith. And we talked a bit about Vietnam, about where I'd been, what I chose to do. And Colonel Beckwith shared some of his general ideas of what he felt the Army should move to and, and where it needed to go and what kind of units needed to be there. And he was very upfront about the, there's a need for certainly conventional army across the board, armor, artillery, whatever. But he said in special operations, there needs to be some, some new units. And he didn't go really much farther than that. And he said, I want you to volunteer for a unit I'm going to start. And he said, I'm going to send you to two schools. Now, I was a staff sergeant at the time. I was an 11 Foxtrot, which was an ops intel type. And he said, I want you to go to Fort Benjamin, Harrison, Indiana, go to school up there. And then he said, I want you to stay in good shape because then I'm going to send you to England to the 2-2 SAS school. And I was floored, most importantly, by the Fort Benjamin, Harrison. Because in the Army at that time, there were only two things that I knew of at Fort Benjamin, Harrison, Indiana, which is just outside Indianapolis. And that was the finance school and the recruiting school. And I didn't want a piece of either one of those. So I asked him. Now, Foreman is sitting there the whole time during this interview in his office, in Colonel Beckwith's office. To make sure that you don't shame him in front of the, the colonel. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> like much. Deeply embarrassing. Yeah. If you do, he wants yeah. to know all about it. <laughs> yeah. He, so, he, so he can take <laughs> corrective actions. And so I, I told Colonel Beckwith that. I said, Sir, I, the only thing I know of at Fort Benjamin Harrison is the recruiting school and the finance school. And I don't really want a piece of either one of those. And he said, well, it doesn't matter what you want, Rice. It's what I want. He said, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. And I mean, what does a staff sergeant say to a colonel? I said, yes, sir. He said, we're getting ready to start this new organization. And he said, I need somebody that I trust that understands the way the Army budgets. Because when those sons of bitches tell me that I can't have something, I want somebody I know and trust that can tell me, oh, yes, you can. And here's how. So he said, I'm sending you to the, to the Army Budgeting School, which when I reported in to Fort Benjamin Harrison, needless to say, I didn't tell him no. When I reported into Fort Benjamin Harrison, nobody knew what to do with me because I'm standing there. I'm a Green Beret in, in bloused boots, and they had never had an enlisted person attend that course. It was all officers who were going to be comptrollers or, or dealing with budgets in their various units and or Army Department of the Army or Department of Defense civilians who were there to learn how to do their jobs, normally like GS-12s and stuff like that, that were officer-type equivalents. Okay, so you got Wales, they knew what to do with you, though. By the time, oh, I mean, oh, you, yeah. you made it through, you made it through Wales. It's, you know, funny accents. Again, a story some, for another day. Some great people, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and, and I've yeah. heard some of those stories, Gr great folks, and were instrumental in kind of their influence on what would become Delta Force. 
Absolutely. Uh, the, the Delta Force selection course that, that was later established uh, used the British SAS course as their model, and, and that was a, uh, quite a course. I mean, <laughs> so you're being humble, Rich. <laughs> so it's called OTC, right? It, it was. It, it now is. It, it, selection and assessment, and, yeah. then, and then you go to OTC later on. And it's, so it's, it's all kind of generally wrapped into one, and it was a, a hell of a training program. And I learned a lot from those people. Oh, I was sorry. I was talking about what you brought back to the States and then established here yeah. uh, by, yeah. by virtue of that. Yeah. So we're, we're going to go back to why it was important that you went to the Fall Saigon, right? And, and so you've got a couple things in the middle. I mean, Eagle Claw being the one that folks know about. And, and Grenada. Uh, both of those occurred, un unfortunately, one un unsuccessful and the other moderately successful. But it, it accomplished what was supposed to happen. And then there was, there was some time that I spent in Central America, in Nicaragua and El Salvador during that period also, uh, 82, 83, something like that. Then I guess it was 85 when I was approached. There was an operation that, that had started to go on that, that another government agency was, was establishing. In this case, the, specifically the CIA was working to support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan with medical supplies, arms, ammunition, equipment, whatever they needed to fight the Soviets because the Soviets had, had invaded and had occupied Afghanistan at that point in time. So I guess the, you know, the important part in this is you were in the system, this OGA type system, and once you're kind of in the system, they, they have you. It's like a Rolodex. For, for those of you kids that don't know what a Rolodex is, it's, it's kind of like the contact sheet in your phone, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, you, you stay tactically proficient, good reputation, people around you vouch for you. I mean, these, these kinds of things, that's, that's how this world goes around. You trade on your name everywhere you go. And well, it's kind of like networking today because you have, you have identified yourself to whomever as an asset that could possibly be used because you've been successful in the past. And so they reestablish contact with you to determine where you are, what you're doing. And at that time, I was in the 5th Special Forces Group again at Fort Bragg, and they needed some teams to assist in that supply chain, if you will, of the Mujahideen through, through Pakistan to Afghanistan. And so we were identified... I, they came to me because I had been an intel sergeant on the team that, that had gone into uh, to Saigon. And there were two, two other guys in my company, one on my team that I was on at that time and one on another team that had been on that Saigon operation. And so we did some, some shuffling of people because they like to work with people they know or that have been with them before. Just makes it easier on them, I suppose. And so uh, in vetting you. And making sure that you're you're correct for that, and so they, put, we put together two two different teams to go to Pakistan and assist in this operation, which we still didn't know exactly what it was. So, had you ever heard of Charlie Wilson? Never had. Didn't know who he was from Adams Off Ox or, or any of these principals who are no. you know all you know the Tom Hanks characters, the, all these you know all these guys in the movie. None of them. Not a single one of them. <laughs> could care less about them, didn't know who they were, and didn't have any desire to know who they were. At that point in time, Afghanistan was a very minor blip on everybody's radar screen, other than some of the politicians and the, and the diplomats that were, that were working that issue face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. So what did you take with you? What was your mission brief? What, what, was, the, what was the game plan? Well, we were told we were going to go into to Pakistan, uh, and, it was a, and it wasn't a denied area. We were, it was friendly, and so we didn't have to worry about infiltration per se other than getting on an airplane and flying to a military air base and then being trucked to wherever we were supposed to go on the Afghan border. Uh, but we were supposed to move in, and then we were supposed to expedite and assist in moving equipment, sensitive equipment uh, in some cases, but equipment and arms and ammunition is what we presume to the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan. So at what point did you realize this was going to be Stinger missiles? Um, we were sent forward to a small village. I don't even remember the name of the darn place now. But we were sent to, to a village basically right on the border of, of Pakistan and Afghanistan. 
And there was an ongoing movement of, again, arms and ammunition. Now we're talking small arms, rifles, rifle ammunition, some medical supplies, I'm sure. There was a little bit of everything in there, but it wasn't anything in particular. And then we received a call late one night that there would be a shipment to us the next day uh, of sensitive items that we needed to, to find a place to secure. Because we'd been securing everything to a degree in, in warehouses, but we were, we were told that this was extremely sensitive and that it needed to go into some kind of a holding area that could be strictly controlled. So how are you living? Uh, we were just living in, in some rented, if you will, hooches. Uh, they're kind of like adobe huts. So what's the roof like? <sighs> there was holes in the roof. There was rats coming through the holes from time to time. <laughs> uh, the the one thing we didn't have was was any silenced weapons because we we had hoped to have those with us so we could shoot rats just to stay busy, something to keep up with. But uh, the the quarters, if you will, were we had three different huts and the team was broke up and living in these huts. And it was paid for, I presume, by the other government agency because we were there just quietly watching this equipment and trying to monitor and figure out what was going on so we could figure out a better way to do it if possible. What we had been positioned for, in my opinion, although nobody ever told us this, was we had been positioned so that we'd be in place when these sensitive, super sensitive items came. We were just told to go there and, and see what we could do to help expedite. But in the meantime, we were gaining a lot of knowledge about what was going on and we're sitting there looking at mountains that are like 11,000 feet tall. And that's pretty foreboding. That's some very tough country. So what are your kind of rules of engagement or what's the, what's the actual tactical piece? Or, or in, in maybe how does it evolve with these new sensitive? Well, there were some with us when we were first deployed were some, some Pakistani military guys, special operations types. And they just kind of remained on the periphery. Nothing in particular kind of struck us as, as bodyguards there to protect us. We were armed, and, and our rules of engagement were we could respond if somebody tried to shoot us, self-defense. But other than that, we were to engage in no offensive operations. That wasn't our job. Right. So, I mean, why were those the rules of engagement? You guys weren't really supposed to be there at that time, right? Well, true. I mean, they, they didn't want to create an international incident. One of the things that was most concerning, and as I look back on it now and have been able to study it some, everybody was very concerned that the Soviets would see any kind of a direct American intervention, arms, ammunition, or individuals as highly inflammatory to them. And it could have created a, a very serious incident that they didn't want to happen at that time. And so we were, we were told to maintain a low profile and just chill. Right. So, I mean, for those of you that maybe haven't read the book and this is not a book report, or, or if you haven't seen the movie, Tom Hanks, we were talking about him yesterday. He's one of the best ever. He's right? great. Charlie great. Wilson's War. It's, it's a great movie to, to go see. Generally speaking, Charlie Wilson was a, a congressman from Texas on the Appropriations Committee, right? Right. And he was kind of figuring out a way to arm the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the hopes of bleeding essentially the Soviets out. Because this is the middle of the Cold War. So right. remember, this is, we're fighting proxy war. Exactly. Of sorts. And so because of all sorts of political and religious issues, Pakistan is what had to be the kind of funding arm to get the weapons through. So President Zia next door was in a bit of a bind as well because he didn't want the Russians to then invade Pakistan. Pakistan, exactly. Right? I mean, pity the fool that is in Afghanistan that then decides to invade Pakistan, but for whatever reason, that was a big, that yeah. was the fear or the, or the risk at the time. So there's a lot of stuff going on and you guys are there and there's just a few of you as, you know, essentially advisors or facilitators or Correct. expediters or, yeah. or whatever. And the last thing that they want in Afghanistan is getting very little press coverage, relatively speaking. And, and so if you're out there listening now, in Afghanistan has been a word that everyone in the world has heard since 2001. It's just, it's rolls off the tongue. Everybody kind of knows where it is now, not just soldiers and Marines and stuff, right. right? It was not like that at all back then. And so the last thing they wanted was some big incident. Everybody was worried about poking the Russian bear. 
Yeah, that, that was a, a phrase that everybody used, the, the Pakistanis, the Americans, everybody. They wanted to support the Mujahideen because they didn't like what the Soviets were doing in Afghanistan. But the Soviets were there with some major armor forces, and nobody wanted to go head-to-head with them in the armor arena. Even America didn't want to. They were very, very concerned about that in Europe. And so you're right. It was the Cold War, and we were fighting proxy wars all over the world. Okay, so back to your your village in Pakistan with your your hut roof with the holes in it where the rats are coming in. It's not exactly OGA luxury of today in most places. No, (laughs) it it, it wasn't a five star hotel. That's for darn sure. But it was at least it was a place to kind of get out of the rain when it when it did rain. And and it was I've I've always found it interesting to be involved and observe the culture around you. And I think that's really important, particularly for special operations people, that they find those kinds of things interesting and they can find ways to blend themselves in. Although they're not going to look like the people, you can certainly act like the people. And so that was really interesting. And so it was just kind of a, we were getting our, our, our feel for the culture, the ground, the, the ground truth, if you will, of what was going on there. What was most interesting? I like to watch people as they as they work day to day. And all along the, the Pakistani frontier, there were a lot of, of guys, and I don't know why they chose to do this, but they're building weapons. They're not building Kalashnikovs, but there's gunsmiths all over the place. And they're fixing old weapons. They're They're making some new weapons. Nothing fancy. I'm talking like Wild West revolvers and and stuff that uh, I'd probably let somebody else shoot it before I shot it, just to make sure. They're a little sketchy at times, but it's a it's a practice. And the and the average farmer in that area that that wants to arm himself because everybody felt they needed to be armed at that time, and very few could get their hands on modern weapons. So the only way they had was to. Yeah, these guys would work on rifles and stuff that looked like they'd come from when the British defended the Khyber Pass, you know, in the 17 and 1800s and, and fought in Afghanistan then. Kind of pitiful, some of them, and some of them were very beautiful. There was some serious artistry going on. And, of course, they'd always add their little inscribed or whatever to it, inscriptions and, and so on. So it was just interesting to see that and the, and the way they lived their day-to-day lives, their markets, their their cooking all very basic stuff, but very interesting to me. What was the food like? There were fresh vegetables. There was some fresh meat, but I didn't know where it came from. So I didn't eat a whole lot of their meat unless I knew where it came from. You, you could ask them and they'd, they'd still tell you it was, it was fine beef from, oh, yeah. from New oh, Zealand yeah. or someplace. And it was probably somebody's poor dog, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I understand. Different cultures... I get it. I just don't choose to participate in that. Yeah, we got in the champagne room at HQ, we got Shiloh and Monster at our feet right here underneath our black multicam tablecloth. It's awesome, right? But I, it is a difference in culture. Like our dogs are... Our dogs are our friends. They're, they're, they're not tonight's dinner. No. <laughs> so in Pakistan, when we were in the village and we were waiting on the shipment of stuff, when we first got there, a dog took up with us. It's kind of a cool dog. Reminded me of Spot or whatever his name was in the Little Rascals because he was, he was pretty much white. He had some spots on him, but he had one big spot over one eye. It's a pretty cool dog. He just kind of chilled with us, and we started feeding him because soldiers feed dogs. American soldiers feed dogs. And it seemed like a good thing to do, and he turned out to be great because he would hang out with us, and then he started living with us. Because the first few days, he'd just kind of show up, and then he'd leave, and he'd show up, and he'd leave. Then he figured, ah, this is where the chow is. This is where I'm going to stay. So he just kind of made himself at home. And we kept him there the entire time. And he was a great dog because anytime anybody other than us would be around our area, he'd growl. Had this kind of a a deep growl. (laughs) Did you guys name him? Somebody named him Figaro. I don't know why. But one of the team guys named him, oh, that's Figaro. I'm going to call him Figaro. It's like, okay, fucking Figaro. Who cares? Spot would have been better, but Figaro was fine. And Figaro hung out the entire time. Even when we would leave, he would stay there because we gave instructions to the, the Pakistanis or that, that came with the agency guys that they were to feed him. And we left food for him and just stuff. You know, he liked MREs. He didn't 
He didn't care anything that was edible he would eat. He hung out with us the whole time. And we really felt bad because we, we left on such short notice that we couldn't take Figaro with us. Now, the guys that were there swore they'd take care of him. I'm not sure what happened. Either. I don't know if that meant they were going to cook him or take care of him, but it, it was really cool. GIs love dogs. Dogs are unconditional love. And in, a, in an area like that, that's exactly what you're looking for. Well, I choose to believe that they hoped that you guys would come back. Yeah. And in which case you would always ask where Figaro was. So they always made sure to treat that dog like royalty. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but there, there was some, some really good food, a, a lot of rice, uh, a lot of rice and vegetables cooked together that I really enjoyed it. I, I had a great time and never got sick. All right. So back to the big sensitive items that show up that now you have to secure in a dedicated warehouse or whatever that was. Well, there was we just down the the block from us, about a half a block away, was a was a large building that was available, and it actually had a pretty decent roof, and it had locking doors, or at least doors that could be made to lock if necessary. And so we decided that that would probably be a good place to put whatever was coming. And that afternoon, later that that next day, the afternoon, the truck showed up, and it it, it was kind of a I call them jitneys. I mean, they're 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 colorful trucks. They're painted all all kinds of of wild colors and tassels hanging on them. The backs were covered, but they're covered with this bright canvas and and what all material was back there. I don't know. So these bright trucks show up, and we open them up, and there's all these dark green olive drab containers inside. Would you do go ah right at home now? <laughs> <laughs> We looked at them and we weren't sure what it was, although we had a pretty good idea because all of us had seen some of these before. And we we pulled out the first one, and sure enough, it was stinger missiles. And there was a, a goodly amount of them. There was probably 10, 15 per truck. And how many trucks? Uh, three trucks. Okay. And so we pulled them out, started pushing them into the, the warehouse, or the, the building that we had found. It wasn't really a warehouse, but it's just a large building. And the more we put in there, the more it dawned on us, these things had to go somewhere. And they're in these, these boxes. And the boxes, uh, you know, the, a Stinger missile is about five feet long. The, the missile itself is about three inches around. The box it's in, I, I'd have to look up the shipping container size, but probably 12 by 12 by five. 12 inches by 12 inches by five feet. They aren't that heavy. They're, they're in the neighborhood of, 35, 40 pounds with a shipping container and everything. So it's it's not all that heavy, but it is heavy. And then you look at that and you look at an 11,000 foot mountain and it's like, hmm, okay. So we get we, we unloaded everything, the trucks left. It almost seemed like when, when the trucks arrived, it was almost like a carnival kind of atmosphere. I think just from the coloration of the trucks and stuff. It was just something new, something different. Even to us, it was like, whoa, okay, this is cool. So got everything unloaded, trucks left, everything calmed down. The Pakistanis that were with us had kind of chased off the crowds because everybody's curious. Uh, everybody has lots of time to spend. And so everybody had come over to see whatever was going on. And we'd just back up a truck and unload a bunch of green boxes. And that was it. So it was like, oh, okay, this is no big thing. Although I'm sure some of them were thinking, gee, how can we steal some of this stuff? And so we decided that from that point on, we understood the sensitivity then of what, what we had in our hands, and it needed to be secured. So we had to start running a guard, an American set of guards on the building 24 hours a day. So a quick question, why didn't you just move your hooch to this nice roof building with Stinger missiles in it? Well, we started doing that <laughs> to, a, to a great degree. Uh, we we set, it, set it up so that the, there was two guys, there was only one door into this place, so that was really all we had to watch out for. There was no windows or anything. And one guy could sleep and the other guy could stay awake. And then we'd shift guards around from time to time. So and it really wasn't a bad building. It was as good as where we were living in the hooches. Okay, so had you fired a Stinger missile yet? Yeah, we had at, back at Fort Bragg. Well, we actually went down to Camp Lejeune and, and fired. What did you fire it on? Uh, they had some kind of a it, – it wasn't a – a drone that we know today, it was, a, it was a larger drone, but it was a flying something or other. 
A sacrificial drone. Yeah, a, a sacrificial drone. It, it wasn't as large as an airplane, but it was bigger than what we we today know as drones with uh, the propellers and stuff that, that lift them off the ground and take pictures and stuff. Uh, I'm guessing it was about a five or six foot long drone, had some stubby wings on it, and it was fired out of some kind of a launcher down there. Okay, so describe how a, a Stinger missile works. Stinger missile comes in basically two parts. Uh, you have the, the grip, which contains the, the I, IFF and the, the targeting system. And it, it's a, a box that's probably eight inches by eight inches, roughly. And then, and then it has a pistol grip underneath. And the tube that holds the missile attaches to that. And once that's attached, you put in a battery pack that has some, I think it was argon, if I remember right, but it, it, some kind of compressed air that when you pull the trigger, once you've locked on with the targeting system, and it's really not that hard to fire, and it's, again, it's not that heavy, once you've locked onto the target and it acquires, then you fire and the argon pushes the, the missile out of the launcher, out of the tube, and then once it's far enough away, probably... 12 to 15 feet, I'd guess, the rocket of the missile takes charge and fires, and that's what takes it to two and a half Mach. I mean, it, it's, it's, it kicks it up there really fast. So did you guys get extra missiles, or did you get firing systems, or what was the... you can Because you can reload it, right? No. Oh, no, it's single fire. Single fire. Okay, got it. So that was the whole point was once we got into the point of, of giving the Mujahideen these things, they had to bring the fired missile back to get a new one. Yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. They also wanted some accountability, I think. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because everybody was very, very concerned that that if we started, and, and this is on the diplomatic side or the, or the governmental side, not the military side, that if we started arming the Mujahideen with these things, then they could conceivably be taken to other countries. In particular, at that time, everybody was worried about Iran, and they would have the means by which to shoot down aircraft. Now, for the most part, they all had SA-7s and stuff that would do the same thing that the Soviets were building and giving to them. But uh, it would be very, very embarrassing to have an American Stinger missile shoot down an American airplane. Yeah. So they're very concerned about that. So, yes, they wanted accountability back. And I understand that later on, uh, and I believe he mentions it in the book, that, that they had a, a wall, a, a museum, a Stinger museum built in Pakistan that had all of the firing boxes up on the wall, uh, with the exception of one, which they shipped to Charlie Wilson. Yeah. And he hung up in his office in Congress. God bless him. <laughs> so, okay, so your, your warehouse with the nice roof that keeps the rain out, that you're yeah. pulling guard on. Yeah. And you've got, now you've got, I don't know, 30 or to 50 stingers, whatever the case yeah, may be. Whatever it was, about 40, 40, I think 40, 45 stingers. Okay. What are your instructions at this time? Orders, I should say. A representative of the CIA, although he, he didn't say he was CIA, but he showed up with the, the right bona fides and, and the right knowledge, came to us and said that we needed to move the, the missiles to the Mujahideen. And then train them how to use them. Because we'd all been trained in how to use Stinger missiles. And that's when it dawned on us again. I mean, we kind of been thinking about it. I think everybody had in the back of their mind. How are we supposed to expedite or move these missiles to wherever they're supposed, their ultimate destination? And at that point, it became really clear that we were going to move these and train the guys on how to use them. And that meant going up the mountain. And I did not relish, nor did anyone else, putting a stinger on my back or two and try to get up the mountain that way. It's just horrendous. Luckily for us, and we had another concern was, okay, if we're going to move these, we're, we're not going to move them all at one time. They're going to have to be moved over a, a period of time. So how do we guard them? If we're going to take the missiles up, how do we make sure that nobody steals any while we're gone? Well, the other guy had figured this out and showed up with a group of indigenous folks that he trusted completely, that had been trained, and that they were going to guard the missiles uh, while we took them over the mountain. A couple of my guys indicated, gee, 
why don't we just teach them how to sh shoot the missiles and then they can take them over the mountain and we'll stay here and guard them. But that wasn't the, I mean, that was, that was kind of tongue in cheek team room gossip, but it, it was at that point that, that one of the guys, we had a, a guy on our team from New Mexico and, and I, I'm sure this had been happening other places, but this was, this was in this one particular village where we were. He, he came back in and he got the detachment commander and said, you know, it's, it's going to be really tough getting the, the stingers over the mountains. And the commander said, anybody got any ideas? And he said, well, yeah, I do, since I brought it up. So why don't we use the donkeys in the corral next door to us? And these are just little donkeys that are they're local. Uh, they weren't brought in from anywhere else. They were just local donkeys, but they were acclimatized. They had been over the mountains hauling other stuff, so why not use them? And it seemed like a, an excellent plan. And so we started playing with how to attach five-foot stinger missile boxes to <laughs> little bitty donkeys. So, so how'd you do it? <laughs> There's always somebody that knows how to do something in, in, in foreign countries like this. And so we went to him, and the, the guy that had uh, come to us, he was from New Mexico, and he had worked, I think, as, in a summer uh, or two summers as a packer hauling hunters into the, to the woods to go hunt deer or bear or whatever they were hunting in New Mexico. And he knew about the, the pack frames that they used on the animals. Now, they were much more modern than anything we could come up with. But he described that to this wood builder in the village who had two or three guys working for him. And they actually crafted some pretty decent, they weren't paneers, but they were, they were frames that we could put on the donkeys and then attach the missile, a missile to each side of a donkey. Now we're talking about a, a missile that's five feet long and the donkey's probably four feet long. So he's got stuff hanging out either side. Right. So how much do those donkeys weigh, you think? I mean, because if you're talking about a couple missiles, what would you say it was 40 uh, pounds each total with all the boxes? Yeah, yeah about that. So, so now you're talking 80 pounds uh, and, a, and a donkey probably, I don't know, donkey weighs maybe 100, 110 at the most. Oof. I mean, I mean they're, they're carrying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so there is, a, there is a rule. This is fast forward a little bit, but yeah. if you go to the Grand Canyon, and you don't want to hike your own ass down into the Grand Canyon and, and up and around, then you can go on the mule, the mule hike or whatever, and the mule will carry all your stuff for you. They actually have weight restrictions on the mules. You, it, they will not exceed, it'll carry you too, by the way, but it will not exceed one third of the, of the mule's body weight. Oh, we were, we were exceeding that like crazy. <laughs> I mean, some of these, some of the little donkeys may have been, I don't know, maybe 140 pounds, but we're not doing the one third rule. That that wasn't a consideration for us at that uh, time. Okay, so instead though, you've got your your buddy from New Mexico. Does he have a first name? You want to make one up? Call it whatever. Mike. Mike. His name was Mike. So Mike from so, New Mexico. Uh, yeah. So by virtue of what he had done, you guys had some Pakistani local woodmakers craft you, in essence, a framed rucksack uh, or of sorts, yeah, right? A frame. a frame to to set on the donkey. And, and then we could attach the missiles to the frame. Yeah. And it was hopefully relatively comfortable to the donkey because we put blankets on the donkeys. Uh, and, and so the, and then the pack frame on top of that and then the, the missiles on top of that. Uh, as I remember, some of the donkeys probably only carried one because it was just, but the, the problem with carrying one, then the donkey is thrown off. So you want to kind of distribute the weight. And there was no way to put a missile dead on top of a donkey without it being real tippy. Yeah. Which you tried to, to hold it down as much as possible. But the donkeys, they, they did yeoman's work that period. So, so what's next? Well, the mountains are tall, and there's very little vegetation on them. So there, there's a little stuff up there for the donkeys to eat, but not much. So one of the guys, and it wasn't Mike, but it was one of the other guys that had been raised on a farm. He said, you know, we need to, we need to take some food for the donkeys. So like what <laughs> we're gonna do what and it just made sense when, when you stopped and, and thought about it because there were there were some areas where there were springs where we could get water but there was very sparse vegetation for the amount of animals that we're we're using to to move up because we were I think we were doing 12 12 donkeys maybe 10 or 12 donkeys so there, there was quite a few donkeys involved in this whole thing 
And so we all put on our rucks with donkey food uh, and, and our own stuff. But we also, each one of us carried some donkey food. Now, the donkeys didn't eat a whole lot, but they needed something. So while the donkeys are rucking the stinger missiles, you're rucking donkey food. Exactly. Awesome. All right. Well, this, is, this is what you sign up for, kids, when you're out there and you're like, I want to be in special forces, right? Seemed oh. fair to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the donkeys seemed to appreciate it. But it was, it, I remember going up the mountains because it, it's little switchbacks, back and forth. It's, it's real slow. And the little donkeys are just taking these little steps. I mean, very small steps. It just it was amazing to me and we're having to keep pace with them which was a little awkward but at the same time i had to keep telling myself if this donkey can make it so can you so keep up so how hard was it the it, terrain when you combine the terrain with the altitude because most there were trails up there but you had to be careful which trails you you went on because you tried not to be out in the total open particularly once we got over the top of the mountains. Because the, the, the Soviets normally wouldn't come over the mountains to the Pakistani side. That was, that was pushing the limits just a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to be as surreptitious as possible. And so there were times when we'd move across scree fields, which are, are just fragments of rocks with very unsound footing, which was very awkward and very slow to move across. Donkeys didn't seem to have a damn bit of trouble with it, but we did. So how big is your whole caravan? There were six of us. There were probably six Afghanis, Mujahideen, and 10 or 12 donkeys. Okay, got it. So the, the, the Mujahideen are basically your guides. They're our the, guides the, the to the paths. Yeah. And, and Cause they knew, like that. they knew the bona fides, they knew where to take us and they knew who to link up with. There were, Two, in the, in the sector where we were, there were two groups, two different groups of Mujahideen, all Mujahideen, but still very tribal uh, organizations. And there were two that had been vetted by the, the agency paramilitary folks as being appropriate to take these, these weapons to. Now, there was others there, too, but they didn't want, they didn't trust them or they didn't want us to take stuff to them yet. Okay, so how long how long did this take mm. to get from where we were in Pakistan to the appropriate Mujahideen camp, if you will? Although it wasn't really a camp, it was just a location. Probably three, three and a half days. It was very slow movement. Yeah, sounds slow. Yeah. So, I mean, where are you sleeping? Is this like how tactical are you guys, or are you just kind of? At the start, we weren't very tactical until we got up into the mountains themselves and started moving through some valleys. And then we kind of, we got much more careful because it was, you could run into anything, although nothing had been identified as a problem at that point. Uh, there was always the chance of snipers. There was always the chance of running into an odd military patrol, Russian patrol, uh, which we were, we were told to stay away from if at all possible and not make contact with anyone. So what was your loadout? All of us were, it was our, our normal loadout that we had gone with, our, our rucks, which probably weighed, rucks were probably 60, 65 pounds, maybe a little bit more. And they got lighter as the donkeys ate, <laughs> which was a good thing. We probably started out around 70 and the, the donkeys ate some. And so it just, it, that, it kind of offset that a little bit. The higher you go, the less you're carrying. Uh, and then our own food, our own gear, our, our own radios, our own weapons, and our own ammunition, personal stuff. So rifle, I mean, rifle, rifle pistol, pistol uh, and, and ammo for both. Say so how many rounds-ish? I think I had eight pistol mags that were full and probably 18, 18 to 20, uh, five, five, six. Yeah. I figured it was more than, you know, yeah. five or six. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. This is what I'm getting at. Yeah. I mean, sometimes yeah, yeah. It's, it's about what I expect. Sometimes it's a lot, lot more. Yeah. So, yeah. okay, yep. just trying to give people the sense. So three. Because well, once you're there, there there's no resupply. Uh, you know, in some situations, when you when you go into a tactical situation, you know that you can get resupplied if it's nothing more than a helicopter flying over, throwing stuff out. Where we had gone or where we were going, there was no resupply available. And so, are you linking up along the way with anyone, or is it just three and a half days of? There would, from time to time, our mujahideen would see another mujahideen, I suppose, and at least they talked to each other. 
and I think what it was, it was people that were stationed throughout the, because the, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't talk about it, but it was people that were stationed as observers to watch Soviet movements and so on. And so our guys were getting updated intel because one of the things everybody was concerned about was once we got to the Mujahideen that we were going to deliver the missiles to, then we became a much larger element and very observable or possibly observed. Yeah. Okay. So three and a half days and then you eventually get there. Yeah. And we get there and there's, there's a, a, a relatively large grouping of people, probably somewhere between 30 and 40 people that were already there to meet us or that had come to meet us. And it, all of a sudden you start feeling kind of vulnerable because <laughs> you, you don't know who anybody is. Now the, the, the paramilitary folks from the agency had already identified these folks and had vetted them when you're standing there looking at a bunch of wild eyed guys, that doesn't mean shit. <laughs> it's like, okay, thank you very much. And so we, I, we certainly identified ourselves. We, we met the, the Mujahideen that were there to meet us. And we began talking about what we were there to do because they, they assumed that we were going to come there and then we were going to lead them into battle. And that was not the plan. I mean, we, we were bringing them something that they could use that could be, the ultimate, but no, nah, we're, we're not there to pull the triggers. So how did they, how did they make it obvious to you that that's what they thought you were going to do? Well, I didn't speak the language and I don't think any of my guys did the agency guys, but there was none with us at that point. They understood or they, they talked either Pashtu or Dari or, or whatever the local dialect. We had to work through an interpreter the whole time. And the interpreter He'd get these confused looks on his face as he's talking to them, and then he'd kind of turn to us and, and would say, okay, just, just tell us everything. And then he would, he would say, well, you know, they're, they're very glad you're here, and, and, and they, they appreciate your support of trying to liberate their country and chase out the oppressors. And like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get, get. We got through all that. Let's keep going here. And he said, and they're, they're so glad that you're here to lead them forward against the Soviets. And I said, oh, we're going to you know, stop right there. That, that, that is not going to happen. And I said, but I, I, we need to say it in such a way that it isn't offensive or that makes us look bad. We didn't want to look bad in their eyes, but at the same time, you know, Hey, here's your missiles. We got to get back and get some more. So we got, we, we still got a big job ahead of us. And so we had these councils and, and sat down with them and, and talked to them. And it, it worked out fine. Then they kind of figured out after a while, okay, we get it. Because we told them, we said, we, what we can't have is an incident here that, that shows the, the United States directly involved in doing this. Although we are here and we're involved in doing it, we want to keep it very low key. Okay, let's talk about these Russian helicopters, these attack helicopters. I mean, th this is sort of the, the reason for the season here, right? Well, and that's what Charlie Wilson, that's what got him all fired up. To, to do all this, as I find out now or later, uh, I didn't realize it at the time that that was the catalyst that really started him on his jihad to support the Afghanis to get the Soviets out of their country. Because the Soviets at, at that point in time had just basically laid waste to everything. Their Hind 24, Hind 24 helicopters, he was a Hind 24, uh, had like 128 rockets, it had Gatling guns, it had door-mounted uh, heavy machine guns. I mean, it was just, it was a killing machine. And the Soviet flyers that were flying the things were basically given free reign. Everything was a free fire zone. So they could shoot anything that moved. And they were particularly at, at this point in time looking at camel caravans, donkey caravans, groupings of people, and sometimes just plain villages with people walking around. There were no threat whatsoever, and they just shoot them up. And that's, that's what really drove the, the reasoning behind supporting the, the Mujahideen with, with weapons, ammunition, and ultimately stingers and uh, British blowpipes and, and all the various uh, and the sundry weapons. Because it, it was more than any one particular weapon. It was an overall delivery of means of war to the Mujahideen, and it was a long battle. That's kind of the look you've got to take. 
And that's what the, the theory was behind this whole thing. Everybody was looking for a silver bullet. And there ain't no silver bullets. There are some really good bullets. And the stinger happened to be one of them. But it, there, there's no one thing that, that answered the mail for these guys. They needed everything to fight with. And that's what they were getting at that point. Okay, so you got to train them up on this. And then you got to get back and do it again or a couple more times. Yeah. We did it two more times. So what's uh, the train up look like? The, again, we're, we're operating strictly through interpreters and we're, we're doing it with small groups of people. You, you can't just take 30 people and stand them around in a circle and inspect everybody to get it. And we had one dummy system that we could use to, to actually put on people's shoulders. They could pull the trigger. Nothing would happen. But then we had to explain what was going to happen so that they understood because when you, when you fire a weapon of any kind, uh, when, when you're a kid and you learn to shoot a shotgun, somebody better tell you what to expect. They, they can never explain it exactly, but they can get close enough. Yeah, they can tell you to put it in your shoulder and not your, next to your eye. Exactly. Right? You know, and, and they explain to you that there's going to be a heavy recoil on your shoulder. So it was explaining to these people, okay, when you put this thing together, and we had to show them how to put it together, because it, it, it comes out of the box, and then you put it together. For transporting purposes, it actually is a, it's supposed to be a pretty rugged weapon. You're supposed to be able to throw it around and, and put it underwater and, and let the snow fall on it, and it, it'll be just fine. Although it, it makes more sense to transport it in the boxes, and then when you get to the close to the firing site, then you open it up, put it together, and then wait for the hind helicopter or whatever air, whatever uh, aircraft that you're trying to shoot down comes by. So it was it was taking them into small groups, and we each would take a small group and then teach them how to assemble the weapon, and and we'd use the the dummy weapon, not not live ones. Then explain to them how to put it on their shoulder, how to get target acquisition. And, and what they would hear, the, the sound that they would hear when it acquired its target, and then to fire and understand that there's going to be a push of gas and a small cloud, and then the rocket motor is going to ignite. I mean, by then, it's, it's a fire and forget. But just want to explain it to them so that they didn't get scared of it and not use it right the next time. And then that rocket motor would take over because by then it had acquired its target and it was going to go kill it. And so to take small groups of, of five or six people at a time and, and teach them this and move through that group, at the same time, they're trying to keep the groups dispersed so that we don't present a, a target picture to anyone else. And every once in a while, you'd hear aircraft flying by, uh, either, either jets flying overhead, and a couple of times helicopters flew by. And they wanted to run out and shoot the helicopters, and we said, ah, no, let's, let's, let's wait till we get you trained. They just wanted to go do it. And there was a couple of times, I think, that we felt like, okay, let's just go out and shoot one. But that wasn't our job. That wasn't what we were supposed to do. And so we trained them. And then since there was that many people, we, now we had just about everybody trained in what, needed, what they needed to know. But we didn't have enough missiles for everybody. And so they started dispersing them. And these guys really had become... I, th I think they describe it in the book as techno gorillas in Kyle's book on Charlie Wilson's war. They had become pretty damn good tacticians that they knew how to fight a war and they knew how not to fight a war. And so they had established logistic systems, rudimentary compared to what we think of as, as logistic systems, but very apropos for them in their country and in their culture so that they would move things forward and they had identified, as best I knew, gunners that would follow that particular weapons system wherever it went to the right place at the right time, and then it would be used. And so we started, started sending this stuff out. And they, they were very careful because one of the things that, that everybody agreed on was don't just shoot one and not be ready to shoot a whole bunch because then you're going to have a different set of tactics used against you. When you start using these things, you need to start using them on a broad front, multiple locations at multiple times that surprise the enemy. And you need to catch them 
when you can surprise them. And that, that happened later on when the first one was actually fired at, at Agram Air Base, if I remember right. They got three hind helicopters at one time, not with one missile, three different missiles, but they got three different helicopters. And it, it changed the whole flavor of the war when that started happening on a broad front. So they started moving this stuff out, and we went back to get some more. And we did that two more times. And it never became really friendly. I don't think the Mujahideen trusted us completely as we didn't trust them completely. I mean, it was, it was kind of, yeah, trust but verify. Common enemy will do that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we were supporting them. They wanted the support. We thought highly of them. They thought highly of us, but we never completely trusted each other to the extent that, that we probably could have if we'd stayed there longer, but we never stayed with them long enough to build up a, a long-lasting trust, which came later. What do you mean came later? Well, as, as special forces teams then came into Afghanistan to fight the Taliban and they, oh, they began yeah, yeah. working with people, they, they formed long-lasting relationships with the, the folks they were fighting with. Yeah, absolutely. As, as opposed to a, a pure guerrilla war where you don't spend that much time with the guerrillas. You, you equip them, you train them, and then it's kind of like shoot and forget. Yeah, I mean, you weren't, you weren't on a true special forces mission. I mean, true special forces missions, you buy with and through your partner force, you, you sleep with them. Exactly. And that, that, wasn't a, that wasn't this particular mission. So anything stand out from the, the next two trips you made up? Uh, pretty much the same as before, different trails going back and, and coming back. The system seemed to work pretty well for us and the, and the other team that was just north of us because we, we had contact with them, radio contact, the commander did, and, and they seemed to be doing basically the same thing we were, and they were making the same kind of contacts we were. I think everybody pretty much felt the same way, that we were successful, that we were, that we were teaching these guys, because the, the system, the Stinger system is a really simple system. I don't know how many misfires they had that, that first time at Bagram. I think they had a misfire. But other than that, I don't think they had very many bad ones. Ultimately, if I remember right, it was around an 80% kill ratio for the, the stingers that went in. Did you see any of them in, in action? Yeah, the third trip we went in, we happened to be, they had at that point started using them. And a, a helicopter got a little too close to, to where we were. We didn't respond to it, but there was a, another gunner, like the next hilltop over, and watched him take it out. And it was kind of satisfying. I mean, I don't like to see people die. Uh, nobody does, except the enemy. And that was the enemy at that point in time. And it, it worked just fine. Huh. So how far away were you? I mean, was it just one major train feature or not? Probably five, 600 meters. That's close. It was, it was close. Yeah, yeah, it was close. And it, one of the things that, that you had to be, we had to be careful with, and we had to specifically train them for, was don't shoot at the aircraft as it's approaching you. That's not the best way to do it because it might not get the heat signature that it needs. Then it's off somewhere and the missile's just kind of out of control and just it has a timer on it and goes off. You have to wait until the aircraft goes by you, then shoot the aircraft from the rear. As, as he moves away from you, as, as close as you can. And so they, they, they set up ways to make disturbances, like they, dust clouds and all this other stuff. That, so one group of guys would go off and do that, while the, the gunners would be at a totally different location. I don't know, but I kind of think that they, they had this thing going that, that, yeah, if you were a gunner, you were cool. But if you were the guy that was, that was the bait or the decoy, you were even cooler because you had the balls <laughs> to do that. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not sure I would, you know, but eh, what the hell? And the other thing we had to be careful with for them was don't fire two at the same time because simultaneously, because then one starts to chase the other and then you're not going to get a, a, a shot at a enemy aircraft. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like you're sniping a helicopter. Yeah. Unless you unless you miss on the first one, and there certainly there were some misses, but then then he's going to turn on you. So you want to be accurate. But yeah, it's it's kind of like I, I hadn't thought of it that way, I guess. But that that's kind of the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you you, I mean, I can I can totally relate. You want to see the the fruits of your labor. 
if you're there against a against an oppressive regime, you know the enemy. You want to see it work. Well, and, and as you mentioned, that what we were doing wasn't the the standard special forces mission. Standard mission would be put us into their village or into their encampment on a on a at least a semi permanent basis, if not a permanent basis, to work with them, by with and through the host forces, and they were the host forces in this case, and. I think in everybody's mind, because we sit around and talk about it a little bit, I think in everybody's mind, we kind of miss doing that because, yeah, we wanted to be there when, when it really went down. And we wanted to be an active part of helping them rid their country of the Soviets. The other thing I think was there was a lot of Soviet Spetsnaz, Soviet special forces in country operating in, in various areas. And it was like, yeah, I, I kind of like to try those boys on see what happens. I'm not sure that would have been a real good idea, but yeah, you know, uh, it, it's, it's just the, the competitive nature of special forces to a degree is to, is to be there when it starts going down. Run to the guns. Yeah. And we, and we couldn't, we, that wasn't our job. And we understood very clearly what our job was. So how'd you guys wrap this up? We got rid of all the, the missiles in the warehouse and then we all moved into the warehouse cause it was a better building. <laughs> <laughs> And hung out there for a while, and then uh, one of the agency guys showed up because most of the Pakistanis, when when that went away, there was still stuff moving through the area, but they were n- nothing that that we dealt with because we didn't have to teach people how to shoot rifles and stuff. They knew how to do that. It was just okay. The agency guys were were hiring people to haul ammunition and weapons over the mountains, but it was standard weapons, not the stingers. So some of the Pakistanis that had been with us left. A couple stayed just kind of as, I guess, translators almost. And then one of the agency guys showed up about four days after we got the last shipment done and said, okay, guys, that, that's it here. We're going to operation shifted to another area and we're going to send you guys home. Okay. And it was, it was all done very quietly. Uh, again, this was a, a Cold War operation. So there were no, no big fanfares, no big parades, no, no goodbyes, no thank yous. Just appreciate what you did. You know, haul, your, haul your butts back to the airfield and be ready to go on this date. And I, I think we were probably all ready to go at that point in time. Because three trips over the mountains was probably enough for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so how long, what was the course of time? I think, if I remember right, we were there about, I think, 100, 100 plus days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think like 110 days. Uh, that that strikes my mind. Was the pay better than normal army pay? It was normal army pay. It was normal army pay. Yeah, we didn't get anything. It wasn't extra. like TDY to this. Oh hell no! Oh, all right. No, you did it for pure love of country. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was nothing. There was there was nothing. Did you guys have hazard duty pay and all that all that jazz back then? Well, you did if you were in a war zone, but that wasn't considered a war zone. Oh. It wasn't our war officially. Exactly. Not yet. Oh, man. You're just a sucker for this kind of <laughs> stuff. Okay, so as you, you know, coincidentally watched Charlie Wilson's war two nights ago, <laughs> g- give us your, your thoughts. Because, look, look you're, you did the, the very kind of final, well, not the final, final delivery, but the, the penultimate delivery of, of the stingers. And now you see this story told, I mean, and it's a great book. So my, oh, yes. my story on, on Charlie Wilson's war is a, a buddy. He was an older, older guy who military supporter never, never joined. He gave me this book before I joined the army. Cause I just wanted to consume everything right about all this stuff. I read a Mac B Sog book or two as well. And I was like, Oh my God, these guys are crazy. Right. <laughs> and not in my, wildest dreams did I think that I would meet someone that was, you know, a part of that in, in any way, or or if I did, I thought it would be, you know, meeting someone in Washington, DC or who knows. Right. But here we are all the better. And it's, it's this other part of the story that hasn't been covered as much or at all. I've never heard any, anyone talk about this to any degree, but just to take it out. I mean, this was your job and you did it and you did it well. And you see this big, this great book, this great movie with Tom Hanks. Like what, what what's your perspective on the whole thing? Well, of course I had a very, just a very small part. Uh, I, I was just a, a small cog in the, in the whole operation. And at the time 
I knew that there was more to it than just what we were doing, but I had no idea what. One of the things that I pointed out to my wife the other night, because we watched the movie, she, we flipped through and she said, oh, I've never seen that. Hey, Nancy, what's up? I know you're going to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, you know, have you ever seen Charlie Wilson's War? And she said, no. So as we're watching it, one of the scenes they show is a refugee camp that they Charlie Wilson goes to along with, with some others. And nobody, I don't think anybody, unless they have been there and seen one, can understand what that feeling is to see a camp of tens of thousands of refugees that have been displaced from their homes and just set on some mountainside that's basically dirt and rock, and that's where they live. It's just it's such a horrendous thing to see humanity reduced to that scale. So I, I had seen that. So I knew there was far more than just us going on. There was, you know, Doctors Without Borders were there. The Red Cross was there. There was all kinds of people there supporting, not just what we were doing. Now, we kind of felt that we were on the front lines because we had, had, had gone on before, but there was so much more going on than, than just that. And then reading the book, seeing the movie, it just comes back to me that it, that it takes so much more. And it, it goes back to something that, I, that Mike Vickers was, was credited with saying, and that was that this was a long-term effort. This wasn't something, there was no silver bullet. There was no, gee, this just happens overnight. This was a long-term patient war, a war of attrition. Uh, any war of attrition is very slow by nature, but it's fought on a broad front with multiple types of ammunition, everything from clothes and food and medical supplies and actual ammunition and weapons and whatever is necessary, that it just, sometimes it humbles you greatly to have been involved in something that was so large. You didn't realize it at the time. I knew, I knew it was big, but I didn't know how big. It was huge at the time. To be involved in something, and you're just a, a small part of that, and yet it really feels good to have done that. It's pretty damn cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean... You know, you start connecting these dots. Like, why is it, you touched on it already before, but why is it that it becomes such a small world? Well, you, you operate in, a, in an environment, or you learn to operate in an environment, and once you're identified as that, as an individual or as a group, then that's the environment that, the, that you continually operate in. And, uh, you know, history repeats itself over and over again. So we should learn from from history, what not to do in the future, but we never do. Human nature stays the same. Yeah. Yeah. Human nature doesn't change very much. And once you have identified into a particular arena, whatever that arena is for you, diplomatic arena, governmental arena, I don't know, military arena, then it becomes an even smaller world and you start finding the cross ties between the arenas. It keeps putting you into that. Okay, you, you know what this was the setup for, right? The small world. Yeah. So let's fast forward. In case you thought this story was over, it's, it's <laughs> not, right? So let, let's fast forward in the, one of the most unlikeliest of unlikely things ever. So I retired in 1994 from the United States Army and had no idea what I was going to do. I ran into a, a colonel that I had worked for that wanted me to come be a college recruiter in Fayetteville, North Carolina at Fayetteville Technical Community College. And I had no idea what that meant, but recruiting didn't sound very good to me. I've never liked recruiters since the first one lied to me. But he said, look, all I want you to do is go out and spread the word. We, Fayetteville Tech, has a government contract that the Army pays for that soldiers can come to from the various units, and we'll teach them additional skills that they can use in the Army and for their regular life. We had a, a, what was called a unit-level logistics system, ULS-G, which was the Army's logistics system that actually Walmart uses in their distribution centers. So we taught that, that automated system. We taught radio frequency management. We taught emergency lifesaver courses for soldiers going overseas that, that were going to be in harm's way. We taught computer classes. We taught all kinds of things. And it, it helped individuals in their army career and in their, in their military career. So the whole idea was 
units could send their soldiers to us, we would train them and give them back with more skills than they'd come to us with. And it didn't cost the unit or the soldier anything. The Army had already paid for it. All it took was the soldier's time to come to the classes. So that seemed like a pretty good deal. Pretty simple to me. So I'd go around and visit all my sergeant major friends and tell them about this. And we did pretty well. Well, then, as I continued on at the school, I went back to school, got my my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. And then I began to move up the food chain in the school. And I became the associate vice president of military programs at Fayetteville Tech. And one day, one of the schools that I had attended, Campbell University, just north of, of North Fayetteville, they came to me and asked if I would come speak to a group of Afghanis that were coming to Campbell uh, that were interested in education. Particularly, they were interested in education for their non-commissioned officer corps and maybe for their officer corps, but particularly, how do they build a stronger non-commissioned officer corps? Because they didn't have a very good non-commissioned officer corps. And that's what we taught primarily was the non-commissioned officers. I said, sure, I'll be happy to come up. So let me check with the president, make sure he's okay with it. So I called him. He said, absolutely, go ahead. So I went up there. And there was an Afghan general and his entourage. I think he had a lieutenant colonel and a couple of majors and a captain with him. And of course, now I was immersed in in academia at, at Campbell because it's a normal university, great school. It's where I got my degrees. But they speak a different language than I do. Yeah, I'm working in a, in a community college, but I'm an administrator. And I understand education, but I also understand administration. So everyone's sitting at this giant U-shaped table that they've built in the, in the cafeteria area, and they're introducing themselves. And of course, I'm the, the low guy on the totem pole. And so they start around, and, and each department chair or whatever identifies himself, gives a little background, and they just keep going all the way around the table. And they finally get to me. And the whole time I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to say? You know, because I'm, I'm not a tenured professor, uh, you know, and an academic chair of a department. And I'm, I'm just a guy. And so I stood up and I, I started off by saying my name. And I said, it was, it was my pleasure in the 1980s that I was able to support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan by bringing Stinger missiles over the mountains to them to fight the Soviets. And I, I didn't think much about that. And then I, I went on to say, you know, I'm, I'm now the associate vice president, of, and, and nobody paid any attention to that because about this time, the general jumped up, the Afghan general, and he ran around the table, literally, and ran up to me and threw his arms around me and hugged me. And the interpreter came with him immediately, and everybody just dead silence. They're just staring. Come to find out, the general was one of the Mujahideen that we had delivered the stingers to. <laughs> I had no idea, no idea that that, that, that that was going to occur. That was just so far out of the realm of possibility that I had, I, it never even crossed my mind. But he was one of the guys that we had delivered the, the missiles too. So a couple things there, right? Just just be yourself, be true to yourself, this whole I'm just a guy thing, right? And what would have happened if you you wouldn't have said that? You know, like, look, look what you would have missed. <laughs> Isn't that great that you, instead of just wringing your hands and, and saying pass, you, yeah. you kind of said that, it? I, I, I just, yeah, I, I was glad I said it after I said it. And then afterwards, he and I sat down and, and talked for, for quite a while uh, about- Gosh, What was that like? Uh, it was really cool. Uh, again, I was talking through an interpreter because because I didn't speak Pashto or or Dari, uh, and he didn't speak English. But he remembered us breaking people down into small groups. We talked about the whole thing, and and how they were so excited to go out and and use these missiles that we had brought to them, that they were sorry that we didn't go with them because they, they wanted to, to show them how good, how good a fighter they were. They're, they're very proud people, and they should be. For thousands of years, they've, they've done some pretty extraordinary things in a, in a country with very few resources. But it was just, it, it was interesting to sit down after all of those years and, and talk to him and remember those times. That was incredible. Who'd have thunk? Yeah. All right. I think we're winding down our, our war stories and free beer with 
brought to you by Rich. <laughs> Did we leave anything big out? Any big lessons or, or takeaways or perspective or, or anything that you want to share with the folks? I don't think anything big. I think, you know, it, this kind of points out to me that as individuals, we can all truly make a difference. You know, when Charlie Wilson started out, because that's what I think about, when Charlie Wilson started out, he was a, a naval officer. His commander said, hey, th this is the greatest guy in the world on ship, but you get him to port and he's, he's trouble. I'm paraphrasing that. But he was kind of a bigger-than-life guy, but he was an individual. And he was an individual that believed in something. And sometimes his motivation may not have been exactly pure, but at the same time, he had a goodness in his heart for people and for doing something for people. And it, I think it just it shows that we can all make a difference in this world, big or small. Uh, we're all not going to be Charlie Wilson. I'm not Charlie Wilson. Uh, you know, I've had some very small roles, but even a small role can be something important, particularly to the individual, and that we should all try to do those things that we know are right and remain true. All right. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of Glorious Professionals. You you have not heard this anywhere else. So if you've enjoyed this conversation that Rich and I have had over a couple of beers, we still have the beers. They still have Christmas stuff on them, but it, this is what we had. Okay, people. So do, do what you have, do what you can with what you have and hope you've enjoyed the, the conversation. Tell a friend, this has been really cool. It brought to, to life in, in so many ways, uh, a book and a story that I, I really love that was made, inspired me to want to go do more. And I think you know, I think that's the value in people sharing parts of their stories, the parts they can. And if, if you're a, a grandfather, talk to your grandkids. If you're a father or a mother, talk to your kids. If you've got a, a friend, a mentor, go, go have a conversation. Buy them a beer or a Gatorade or an orange juice or a water. I don't care. It, whatever, whatever's best for, for you. And ask them about their lives. And that's a, a really good piece of advice I got a long time ago. I think it's pretty common. It's, you know, find someone that you respect and ask them about their lives and shut you may, up. You may be listen. surprised at what you hear. You may be surprised what you hear. And so thanks for sharing your story, Rich. And to all you out there, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>